and to continue this journey today to really bring you the best in what is happening in uh, evidence around the adoption of digital health technologies. Uh, we have two of our favorite people in the HitLab community, Fran and Rachel, and they are going to talk today about what is happening within this very important area of coverage that we've seen grow, but as it's growing, we've also seen gaps. And they're here to talk about the digital capacity of our society to work together and to really improve and reduce the social determinants of health. Uh, and I will hand the virtual podium over to Fran and Rachel. Thank you both for joining us today. And Thank Fran, you, Stan. Thank you, Stan, so much for having us here today. We're really honored to be able to participate in this amazing summit. And I'm super excited to be able to introduce you to Rachel George. We're going to have a phenomenal conversation to kick things off. Rachel, how about you go ahead and start by uh, giving us a really brief introduction to yourself and your area of passion. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Fran. And um, good morning to everyone or good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you might be in. Um, my name is Rachel George. I am an internal medicine physician by background, um, but I have been uh, leading different healthcare organizations for the last you know, 15 plus years, uh, mainly in the provider services space. Um, more recently, I've been working with Salesforce to really work with organizations to help them understand how the technology can be used to solve their the challenges that they're facing um, and also to help Salesforce identify the gaps that we're trying to fill and to help support um, uh, creation of um, identifying that white space that needs new solutions and, and help to work on creating those. So super excited to be here. Love the team here at HitLab. Um, and this has been a remarkable conference till now. Indeed, it has been. So let's just jump right in, Rachel. You know, I uh, this morning, very early, 5 a.m. was on a um on a program that was put on by Itsas Mori that was looking at the needs of uh, women and how culturally there have been such significant biases that have impacted uh, the way that care has been being delivered. Um, and that really makes me think about broadly some of the health inequities that exist overall. Curious to know what your thoughts are, and as we sort of titled this, since really kind of looking at some of the um, sort of pushing the reset button, if you will, on, on digital health, what does that mean, really mean to you? What do you think are some of the gaps that exist and where we need to begin to focus now in this uh, sort of post-COVID uh, era, if you will? Yeah, no, great question. And so as, you know, COVID um, obviously was not great in a lot of ways, but it did do some um, positive things and that it really jump-started technology specifically within healthcare. Um, the need for um, tele medicine consults, you know, telemedicine increased dramatically in a way that would never have happened without COVID. It would have happened much slower without COVID. Um, and there were some technology breakthroughs that happened because of the, the challenges that we faced uh, with COVID. We're all used to staring at each other in little little boxes uh, now in a way that we were never used to before. Um, but it's given us an opportunity to really reevaluate what we're doing in healthcare. As we know, women make a uh, you know, the majority of healthcare decisions for their families, um, whether it's for their children, for their spouses, or for their parents. I mean, solidly, I know that I'm solidly within the sandwich, sandwich generation trying to juggle, you know, both my children's health as well as my parents' um, health. And a lot of women find themselves in this situation. And we know that consumers want more digital options for healthcare. How can we make it easier for them to juggle all the things that they're doing? How do we make it so that there's a digital front door so that they can do a telemedicine visit that will get reimbursed by their insurance that they don't have to pay out of pocket for? How do we make it so that scheduling is easier so they can schedule multiple appointments for multiple people all at the same time? I think there's also tons of um, opportunities in what's happening with, um, I, I think COVID made it very clear that we've done a horrible job, um, not only in this country, but internationally of identifying the different types of people out there that we need to create solutions for, right? It's not just white men or white women, right? We have 
people of different ages and races and genders and uh, sexual orientation and all of that needs to be taken into account. So we had a, a, a ton of drugs that were, for example, approved in 2020. And uh, of the drugs that are approved, you know, of, of the studies that were done, seven, over 70% of the people who participated in those studies were Caucasian. And that what that does is it limits the um, the ability to be able to understand how those drugs could impact different um, races, social and economic status. Um, something very basic um, that we identified that became very obvious during COVID uh, is a pulse oximeter. We've been we were talking about pulse oximeters and people were buying pulse oximeters at home to see how their oxygenation levels were. Well. Pulse oximeters were all tested on Caucasians, and actually, the amount of melanin in a in in somebody in people of color actually makes pulse oximeters less accurate. Um, and so, how do we correct for these things? And how do we find? And how do we use digital? And, and and I think the opportunity that we have is to use um, the information that can be gleaned from a digital platform to ensure that we are honestly creating, um, honestly finding a very diverse population as we're testing drugs, medical devices, um, and using our technology to actually be able to recruit a much more diverse population than we than we have in the uh, in the past. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit more, Rachel. You know. Um, Participation, patient um, or subject recruitment is a challenge area, right? What are some of uh, the things that you see as uh, contributing to those challenges in relation to ensuring that there is peri inclusion and representation and, and, and uh, trial design and trial conduct? Yeah, some of it is is um, identify. Some of it is creating a, a a database that's truly diverse, right? Um, drug companies, med device companies, anybody who's conducting a trial relies on their database. So, how do we create a database that's truly diverse? How do we use technology to identify people with a specific disease order, uh, disease or disorder that um, is present throughout the country and not necessarily around an academic medical center that might be conducting the trial. How do we expand that so that we can um, we can do a better job with that? How, how do we randomize people to clinical trials to ensure that there is a better dispersion of the different types of social and you know, economic people? And how do we identify the people that we don't even know about? And, and what I mean by that is, so if you look at something as simple as obstructive sleep apnea, Right, it's a disease that is commonly, you know, you, you you know about it commonly because people snore when they have it, but it causes a lot of issues, including a decreased oxygenation and resulting in heart and lung issues. It, historically, the only way to test for that was to go into a lab for one overnight, sometimes more than one night, and be connected to a whole bunch of electrodes and um, and do a sleep study. But that doesn't account for people who aren't close enough to get to a sleep lab. It doesn't account for people who don't have the ability to stay overnight because they're a single parent, for example, um, and can't leave the house overnight, or they work a night shift, um, or they are claustrophobic, whatever the reason may be. We don't even know about these patients that we don't have because we have limited um, the ability to be able to test into a very specific way of testing. How do we go beyond that? And uh, there are now devices that actually allow you to test at home um, in your own environment that allows you to do it in your own way. But how do, how do we use that learning, right, to go beyond and identify the biases that we've had in the past that restrict um, the care that uh, people are receiving as a whole. That's such a valid point. You know, um, Dr. Um, Ian Roberts, who's with uh, London um, School of Medicine and Tropical um, Studies, had just uh, had shared um, research that he had actually put out in in um, in May 
around uh, drugs for uh, f drugs, co coagulation drugs for um, preventing um, blood loss and hemorrhage, and how those medications um, had not been e uh, equally distributed for both men and women. And the, dis the justifications were that they didn't work uh, as well for women as they did for men, but their study actually found the contrary, that they're as equally uh, uh, eff efficacy, if you will, uh, for both men and women. And despite putting this information out, um, it didn't create any al alarms in the in the society at all. Um, seemed to be an, an over missed um, uh, topic and and something that didn't come up as as discussion. As discussion, we further see that uh, when it comes to the recruitment process with pharmaceutical companies, um, it's not a lack of access to individuals and lack of access to women to participate in these trials, but it's a deliberate. Uh, decision by these institutions to elect to use a, uh, a population that they are most uh, familiar with. Um, so I'm, you know, I'd, I'd love to know, um, as you sort of put a call to action out, what you would uh, like to be able to call upon um, the general public, for those of us who are in the digital health space, um, for those who are really advocates for patients, what you'd like to see uh, done and how we perhaps can put more pressure on a culture that has had a, a historical bias towards um, one particular gender over another. Absolutely. So I, I just want to think about one more example really quickly. Heart attacks. You know, the, the, the traditional example that we've heard of heart attacks, you know, pressure in, in the chest and, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the middle of the chest, that is a typical male response. It's actually not that common in women. Women actually present in a lot of different ways that haven't been communicated to the general public. So how, and so you ask a great question, what do we do? I think identifying that we have a problem, being cognizant of the problem. So if nothing else, I hope this conversation, you know, kind of helps people think about the fact that, oh my gosh, we have a problem. How do we um, alleviate our own unconscious, sometimes conscious, often unconscious biases that prohibit uh, us from identifying, making sure that we have a truly diverse population. The second thing is I think we, those of us in technology have the opportunity to really create systems that are unbiased, that are truly um, uh, gender neutral so that we can make sure that there is a truly diverse population um, of, of people that we are testing, studying, evaluating so that the results that we have are truly diverse. I mean, I think right now it's a great time to be in technology and healthcare. Um, it's super exciting, the changes that are happening. But for those of us that are there, we have to work really hard to really uncover all of those unconscious and conscious biases and actively work against them. Absolutely. Well, Rachel, it again, it is such a pleasure. Um, folks, remember, um, it is actually very well known that uh, the health of women is the number one indicator of the wealth of a nation. So let's reflect upon that as we are pursuing, um, you know, great advances um, economically and technologically, um, and that it's necessary for us to be a diverse in, in the work that we're doing. Stan, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us today and uh, looking forward to the rest of this amazing summit. Thank you for having us. Thank you. No, it's fantastic, Fran. And uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you both. Wonderful to have you today. And, uh, you know, again, I, I love that last statement that Fran just made about the health of women. It is incredible. And, and it just absolutely resonates with all the research that uh, you'll find on Google Scholar. If you take a look at the, uh, the health of women and the health of families and uh, even villages, whether it's a village in uh, rural New England or uh, rural Texas or uh, Central Africa, Latin America, Asia, Europe, it is really the cornerstone of what we've seen and uh, the research backs it up. The evidence is there and, and uh, some of the studies that I've done in Ghana and India uh, it's they, they really do focus on that. And institutions like the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, they understand that as well. And so it's incredible to see uh, just how much hinges on that statement. So really well done, Fran. Thank you very much.